Well, while we're talking about the actual process, it's a pretty top-level question. Vincent Thomas says, what exactly do you listen for out there in the stars? And just to be clear, I just want to, like, just... The radio telescopes are like other telescopes. They're detecting light. So somewhere in the decades past, people have equated a radio telescope with listening to sounds, and people think we're listening for sounds. And they they did that with, you know, in the movie Contact, where Ellie Arway is listening to her data. But these are observations of radio light, correct? And we're just being loose when we say we're listening. Is that, that's like saying, oh, let me listen to the sun and just like look at it, okay? No, you're like receiving light. Martin LeBlanc from Montreal does end the question with... And Neil, for this episode, I dare you to change your saying with uh, keep listening up. Oh, <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll do it just for him. Okay. <laughs> but Jill, let's get your reaction to that. What we use instruments to try and detect is the kind of emissions that nature can't do. And that generally means... Uh, some kind of transmission that is very compressed in frequency because nature doesn't do that. Nature's emissions come from gazillions of molecules and atoms, each of which is uh, vibrating or rotating and emitting a very specific frequency. But all of the atoms and molecules are moving with respect to one another so that the uh, ensemble signal is Doppler broadened. So each of these individual uh, transmissions from a molecule or an atom gets added with all the other molecules and atoms that are all moving relative to one another, and you get a broad signal. But technology can get around that. We have means with lasers and masers of uh, compressing a signal into a single frequency or a small range of frequencies, what we call narrow band transmissions. And either we'll learn something expect unexpected about nature and find that nature can do this job and trick as well as we can or better, or we'll find evidence of the technologies that we're looking for. And so it's not just that the signal exists. You might want or expect or hope that signal to also contain information within it. Again, in the, in the film Contact, the signal was, at least in the film version, it was uh, prime numbers, I think it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, whereas I think in the novel, it was digits of pi, perhaps, but I might be confusing my memory. But within the signal, there, were, there was information. So are right. you, can you decode if you did find the narrow band? Or do you have a next layer analysis to see what they might be trying to tell us? Well, again, that's one of the reasons that I want to tell everyone what we may have detected and what we've interpreted because there are far better code breakers out there than me. Um, mm. And so we'd be eager to engage the intelligence of the rest of the world to help us understand any information. And one thing that I should mention is, although we talk about listing and we talk about radio, and I've argued that other frequencies don't travel as far through the galaxy as the radio wavelengths. We are also trying to use the take the techniques that we have and push them into the infrared and the optical um, for sources that are closer by. All right. Well, it sounds like you're on top of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? I'll let you know when we succeed. <laughs> yeah, we'll know we've done the right thing when we succeed. So Jonas Dravland says, Good day, doctors and lords. Jonas from the Appalachian foothills of North Carolina. If there were a SETI-like organization on a distant star system, 
how close would they need to be to detect us? Would they be able to watch I Love Lucy? And should they expect to pick up their domestic radioactivity, or are we basing our search on the presumption that they are sending signals intended to advertise their existence? Ooh, yeah. So I'd love that because our earliest radio signals are just our earliest escaped television broadcasts, right? Now going into 100 years, you know, 80, how many years ago? Early, well, I Love Lucy was 1950s and 60s. Uh, well, the honeymooners, are they mm-hmm. going to learn how men and women interact on earth from those two shows I hope not. 1950s TV and earlier radio? I think what might be detected is not the information content of the television program, but the existence of the carrier signal that transmitted that information. Um, Or maybe once we detect evidence of someone else's technology, they're going to explain, and we translate it somehow, they're going to explain to us um, why <laughs> why Lucy and Ethel um, shouldn't have had sub- subservient roles. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Alice and the Honeymooners. Yeah, all of, oh, yeah. All of the above. Yeah, right. Catch us up, just briefly, take a, a break from the questions and ask you, uh, what telescopes do SETI uh, are in the arsenal of SETI's control? Well, we have a special telescope that we've developed for working in the um, infrared and optical that we call optical SETI or laser SETI, I should say. These are special instruments that we've developed. Uh, otherwise, what we use is um, existing telescopes that are part of the astrophysical uh, realm. And we can essentially piggyback on the signals being detected by those telescopes, which are looking for other things in other ways. But we can carve out a piece of that signal without affecting the primary observer and we can analyze it looking for these techno signatures. So um, it's really anything out there that's looking at the universe. We are eager to uh, replicate their data so that we can analyze it in a different way. And the SETI Institute is, is mostly privately funded. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yes. We have, we do, well, I shouldn't say that. SETI at the SETI Institute is is privately funded, but we have over a hundred PhDs at the SETI Institute who are looking um, in many different ways to discover life beyond earth. And these programs are typically funded by the National Science Foundation and NASA. So we do have government funding, and we're very nervous right now about what's going to happen. uh, Science funding in many realms today feels like, uh, oh, science is just optional. You know, other things are more important. That like there's been a shift in priorities, which Mm -hmm. will have consequences that people do not we foresee, but the general public doesn't really, given how much of modern civilization pivots on the moving frontier of science.